Hey, good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Monday, the second day of May 2022, and it is time for the resumption of the hurricane outlook and discussion here. Uh, it is May. It is the start, the gateway here into the Atlantic hurricane season. Now, it is still severe weather season, and we're going to cover lower 48 weather and any severe weather threats that could be coming up. We do that at the end of updates like what we do here at the beginning of each week. But otherwise, the branding here and our themes in general are going to go revert back to the hurricane. That's what we're known for. Here's why I got the shirt. You know, I'm a weather geek at heart, and we certainly have the support uh, and the technology to cover other weather. We were active this winter, especially in January, with a string of winter storms. Uh, also working on some stuff for severe weather coverage. But it's hurricane track. That's what we're known for. Uh, that's what I went to school for. So... Here we are. It's time to get ready for the upcoming hurricane season. Good to have you along with me. We've got a lot to talk about today, so let's get started. First, National Hurricane Center launching the Hurricane Preparedness Week, May 1st through the 7th. So that includes today. So it goes Sunday through this following Saturday. And uh, there's a lot of excellent resources out there that they have put on their site and sister sites and related sites. From there, I will link to this one right here in the description of today's video, so make sure you check that out, and, you know, especially if you're new to the coastline somewhere. Uh, you might very well be, you know, and depending on when you see this video, it could be weeks or months from now, this is a good resource for you. Now, I want to talk about things from just a slightly different perspective um, and show our map. You know, why are you showing your map there? Well, this is a JPEG of our paper tracking map, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of where you can get one a little bit later, but I want this whole thing to be a sales pitch in and of the fact that I do want to pitch this new idea. See that at the bottom down there? Let's look at it. SWIFT, the acronym. Now, the National Hurricane Center did a really good job, I thought, in sort of highlighting five hazards. We've kind of narrowed it down to four. There's certainly a fifth one there, rip currents. But these four, SWIFT, surge, wind, inland flooding, that's the IF, and then the T for tornadoes really does make sense because what I want to do, and if I was in charge of everything, I could just snap my fingers and make anything I want happen, I would say let's not look at hurricane categories as a way of planning. I think that's antiquated and not helpful because a lot of people plan for what they're going to do based on a number, one through five. And usually when it's three, four, and five, they start to do something. Yet, in the number one category, that IF of inland flooding can destroy their entire livelihood, their house, their business, and they might even be killed. Seriously, inland flooding, you can get inland flooding from a depression, and that doesn't even have a name. It's just, you know, O1L or whatever. It's a depression. I mean, we name these things O1L when they become a depression. It's a whole naming situation, but it's not... Andrea or Barry or whatever, a depression, and they can still cause inland flooding. Just a tropical low can do that. No category. So let's stop thinking category. All right? It is important and it has its place, but in my opinion, no place in planning because it doesn't tell you about what could happen to you from these hazards. All right? So let's start thinking this way. Swift surge, wind, inland flooding, and tornadoes. And we printed this this year on our paper tracking maps. I wanted to introduce it, get it out there, and start kind of rebranding this whole idea of how we think about hurricanes and their impacts, because it is about the impacts, where you live, where you work. All right? So I would say, you know, on this first day that we're going to talk about hurricane preparedness, and I'm going to do a video every day this week, Today is sort of the introduction. Number one thing, figure out where do you live and work and go to school, maybe one of those three or all of those three, in relation to those four main hazards. Do I live in a surge zone? Do I live where the wind could really be a problem? Am I, am I in a well-built structure with $50,000 hurricane shutters or Am I in a less substantial building? Am I someplace with a lot of trees? These are questions you need to find out the answers to for yourselves, okay? And then the inland flooding part, that's a tough one. How close are you to river basins? 
you know, and then the tornado part, eh, there's not much you can do. You got to maybe get radar scope or something or a uh, radar omega or any of the free. Um, I mean, I think those apps have free components to them. There's a lot of good radar apps, but the idea is to be aware, be educated and stay engaged. All right. So today, the introduction to all of this, again, figure out how am I say to yourself, self, what are my vulnerabilities to these particular hazards? Surge, wind, inland flooding, and tornadoes. Uh, a little advice on who to talk to about that. Find your local emergency management agency or office. Different areas of the country, whether it's counties or parishes, are going to have different people that are in charge, but it's usually Office of Emergency Management, EOM, or Emergency Management Agency, EMA, and you can just find them on social media, whatever your county or parish may be, and ask them. You do the at thing. Hey, at whatever the county emergency management agency is, you know, you know how you do that. You talk to somebody on Twitter and you say, hey, or maybe you direct message them. Most of them have direct messaging uh, available so you can ask them a private question. I want to know where I live in relation to storm surge. Where are my shelters? You got to do the homework. You have to ask the questions, figure out your vulnerability, and then from there, develop a plan based on that. It's pretty simple, but for each individual one of you out there, it becomes very complex because hurricane preparedness can be very expensive and very stressful. All right. But at the end of the day, let's take those categories and just kind of say, all right, the Saffir Simpson scale is out there, but this is a better way to think impact, swift, surge, wind, inland flooding, tornadoes. Just start doing it. Start memorizing it. All right. And don't make me create a jingle. All right. If I have to create a jingle, then we're in trouble. We don't want to have to go there. Swift, 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 swift. Surge, wind, inland flooding, and tornadoes. All right? All right, let's move along. We're going to revisit some of this stuff uh, a little later. Uh, in the week, we're going to look at those individual uh, impacts each day coming up. So let's move along to the rest of the meat and potatoes of today's update. By the way, we're over here at Storm 2K in the indicators thread for 2022. And some of these uh, discussions here, the, these posts that people are making, these are some pretty big headlines here. This is some stuff from Ben and some other folks that are out there, including David Bernard down there at Fox 8 in New Orleans tweeting. I went ahead and pulled it out here. Yeah, there we go. One significant sign that could mean lots of Atlantic Basin storms, he says, retweeting Phil Klotzbach. Look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, this should be a headline in and of itself. The Nino 3.4 area right here in the heart of the Nino area of the tropical Pacific. It's part of these ENSO areas that we talk about. ENSO, E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation. That it's the coldest April weekly anomaly, negative 1.1 since 1999. Wow. What happened in 1999? That was a big season. And we had the classic look to that season overall. It gave us Floyd, among others. But Floyd, if you don't remember, was this close to being a catastrophe for Florida and the southeast United States. It was bad enough for the Carolinas. I was in the eye of that hurricane, one of the very first in the early days of my career. Um, but that is a huge, huge, huge tweet that uh, Mr. Bernard retweeted there from our good friend Phil Klotzbach at Colorado State University. Very, very eye-opening there, all right? Let's move along. This interesting tweet here from Danny Mars. Now, Danny is a CPA, Certified Public Accountant. You're like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, he's got an interest in tropical meteorology. I like finding people that are engaged on this stuff. You know, they're following it. They're, they got a passion for it. They know what to look for. You know, kind of armchair meteorology, that's fine. As long as you're not sensational and putting out misinformation, this is some good stuff. So Danny's picking it out. The new can sips, this is that Canadian um, version of like aggregation of models to understand a long-term climate signal. That's an interesting sort of way to look at it. Uh, they had some issues. They're fixed, hopefully. Um, but boy, it just looks like the Atlantic is highly favored here with sinking over the Pacific here. That's what this is, sinking motion, rising motion over the Indian Ocean and, and Africa. 
Now going back to the Storm 2K thread real quick, you can see this also referenced here from the tweet from Ben Knoll as well. And he has blended it all together, uh, the August through October time frame right there. See? There you go, highlighting it for you. Look at all the rising motion over here, especially over Africa. That gets the tropical waves going. The African easterly jet primes the Atlantic, ready to go. The Atlantic's going to be nice and warm. The sinking, though, the true downward motion is over here. Sinking air in the tropical Pacific here, rising motion coming out into the Atlantic with these systems, meaning, and I mean, this is, this is the look. This is what we saw in 2020. This is what we saw to some extent last year, a very similar pattern set up. But the difference is that La Nina uh, that I just showed you here from Bernard and Phil Klotzbach's tweet, that is very, very different. Um, and it's not, it's not that it's very different from 2020 especially, but this is very significant in that it primes the season for being very busy here. Uh, scooting on down a little bit more. From uh, Mr. Morris here, the notable uh, signature in the model, picking up on the warming in the eastern Atlantic while leaving a less pronounced warming area of subtropical Atlantic warmth. Just different things that are being picked up by observant people. The steering pattern, now this is interesting, kind of this uh, positive height anomaly sitting over the northwest Atlantic when this is when we get for September, this is valid in September, positive heights over the northwest Atlantic, southeast Canada, that keeps the storms from curving out to sea. Doesn't mean they all are going to hit land, but that is a favorable landfall signature. And again, this is the reference again uh, from Ben Knoll, uh, kind of the same thing that, uh, that Danny Morris there was tweeting about. So kind of slow things down a little bit here. There's a lot coming at you. These signals that have just come out, some of this gets generated in the very first of the month, the can sips as an example, and, and even Ben here uh, referring to the fact that they look like they have uh, fixed it there. There were some issues, some bugs in the Canadian model, uh, but boy, the look to the hurricane season coming up is very significant, and I'll show you this graphic over here. We're going to get to that in just a minute, and I think it will really make sense to you everything that we've covered so far. All right, moving on along. Actual sea surface temperatures in the Gulf, they continue to warm. Let's outline this real quick with the color black. There's your 26 Celsius isotherm. That's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, just a little bit shy technically. But a good chunk of the Gulf now is warm enough for tropical activity. But other factors keep it, you know, tame until later. Thank goodness, I think we're going to have a busy enough season. We might as well wait as long as possible. So the Gulf warming up, as we would expect. Also off the Atlantic, again, we're losing the gradient over here, especially off the southeast coast uh, of my area. I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. Still some pretty cold water um, along the mid-Atlantic and east coast over here, butting up against the warmer Gulf Stream. And so you do have that temperature gradient that is still pretty prevalent right through here. But gradually, as we would expect, Water temperatures climbing as we get towards the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. Now this is truly remarkable. I want you. I tweeted this a little while ago, uh, and I mean I try to keep things even keel. We don't hype stuff if it doesn't need to be hyped. I mean, look, if we see something we think is going to be deadly and a real problem, we're going to tell you. Now this isn't that, but this is certainly worth noting. And when you've done this long enough, and I've done this for more than 25 years, and you look at that, you say, that's the look. That's what it looks like when you have a busy hurricane season. What am I seeing? Well, look at this. Off the coast of Greenland and Iceland, the Iberian Peninsula, the Azores, curving down almost like a horseshoe of warm anomalies. The water is warmer than average. In the subtropical Atlantic, it's a little bit cooler than average. And then in the Pacific, colder than average in the La Nina area, as we talked about. That is your almost perfect setup for a very busy season. This horseshoe shape here, your classic positive AMO, or Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, just a fancy way of saying the Atlantic is favorable, the Pacific adding to it. Wow, that is the look. When you want to say, you know, look at it forensically, 
Hindcast. What does the Atlantic look like when it's busy? We can go back and see this. That's what you look for. That is the thumbprint, the fingerprint, the whatever. There it is. Plain as day. Uh, this isn't made up. This isn't, you know, uh, skewed to fit some agenda. This is what it is. And this is the look that should get your attention. Hey, I need to be ready this year, wherever it is. The Azores, the Caribbean, you know, uh, Central America, Florida, Maine, uh, Canadian Maritimes, Bermuda, Texas, everybody. That's the look. That's what you look for right there, folks. That's it. Look at that. And why has this happened recently? Well, we've had a large area of um, low pressure, basically dominating the Atlantic, generally speaking, keeping the trades from screaming across this way, and we've allowed the Atlantic uh, to warm because the trade winds have not been overly strong. And so there you go. That's the result of it. All right, so what's happening out there? Luckily, nothing. It's only May 2nd. Uh, a lot of telltale things here. Strong upper level winds cutting across. You know, it's not time yet. There's more strong upper level winds. Um, a lot of westerlies. A lot of westerlies, which is what you would expect this time of year. And, of course, we're dominated by a lot of mid-latitude storms still cutting across the North Atlantic, you know, over the lower 48, etc. Uh, trades are good down here. They're blowing, but they're not as strong. So we're seeing the Atlantic Basin warm anomalously so all right by the way we will start to see some percolation of convection uh you know like a coffee thing percolates or whatever you call it uh popcorn storms whatever we're getting there the eastern pacific season starts may 15th so we might get a name storm over there before the end of the month that wouldn't be unusual and where do we look we look generally in this area early in the season you know, mid-May on these last few years, something popping up in that area wouldn't surprise me at all. Between May 15th and June 15th, probably going to get a name storm somewhere in there. That's a safe bet. So get ready. It's coming. It's May 2nd. Use the time now to prepare. Swift, remember? Swift. All right, we will be looking at this a lot in the coming weeks and months, the vorticity map at about 5,000 feet in the atmosphere. That's my favorite area to look. Why? Because this shows me the structure at the low levels, the skeleton of our developing systems. Luckily, we don't have any developing systems in the deep tropics right now, but there are some areas of vorticity or spin in the tropics, but they're weak, stretched out, like that one, this over here. You know, you can see what I'm talking about, but none of these are bundling up. There's a little bit of energy. This comes off of the uh, mountains here of Colombia, the way the trades go through there. It's a whole other physics and meteorological, uh, meteorology lesson as to why you get that. And sometimes these can help to spur a spin-up. Usually they end up in the Pacific. Um, and there's a little bit of concentration right here along the intertropical convergent zone, but nothing like what we're going to be seeing later in the year. But this is the map. This is the graphic from the University of Wisconsin that we will refer to fairly often. A lot of the energy is still over the lower 48. There's the setup for today's severe weather. As an example, there's some more energy up here in Canada and some more energy in the North Atlantic. And eventually all of this stuff, this energy will lift north and then we will start watching the deep tropics down here for bundles of vorticity, bundles of energy that come together over the warm humid air mass, uh, the oceans, all that combining the warm Atlantic giving birth to these tropical children, trying to be poetic about it, but uh, that's the map. That's what we, we will refer to often. All right, real quick on severe weather. It is important for a number of reasons. You know, if you're interested in hurricanes, you probably have an interest in other weather, maybe. I know I do. I'm, a like I said, a weather geek at heart. That being said, moderate risk of severe weather today. What does that mean? A yeah, pretty decent chance of some tornadoes in a fairly small area. But as we saw with the jaw-dropping video out of Andover, small can mean a small area. I mean, hey, it's, it's, if you live there, that's a problem. So even though it's not a big, widespread, regional, massive you know, tornado outbreak, and thank goodness it's not, it's still problematic for the people who have to deal with it. So you all be aware if you're out in that area. That's the tornado threat for today. Um, and 
that's about it. At least it's isolated. Because I noticed I'm in the marginal. You know, Well, I'm actually right down here in southeast North Carolina, just out of the marginal. But anyway, tornado threat greatest in the central part of the alley. Wind as well. Straight line winds, downburst. And then hail, some pretty big hail. Yuck. Smash your windshield out, hail. And then even a uh, threat of hail here in eastern North Carolina and south central Idaho. So just be mindful of that. Be aware. That's what the goal is. Keep you aware. There's so much going on in our lives. We live in the world of 10, 20, 30 second TikTok. Got to keep your attention long enough to keep you safe. Tomorrow, severe weather threat. Not as bad, but it does shift into parts of the Ohio Valley. Day three, Wednesday, back to the heart of Tornado Alley with an enhanced risk. Again, in the area, uh, right where you'd expect it this time of year. Lots of chasers are probably out there. We will probably see in a, a moderate uh, go up in some of this area as well. Wouldn't surprise me. And then beyond that time frame, day four, it shifts to parts of the, uh, the Mississippi Valley. And then days uh, five, six, seven, and eight, probability, predictability, all that good stuff, just a little bit too low to show up. But I think it's going to stay active. This is the 500 millibar region of the atmosphere you know what we got this is the lower 48 there's the east coast florida you know just outlining it for you there's the west coast you, you, you good you, there's kansas all right everybody acclimated you know where we are good so 500 millibars about 18,000 feet up and you can see all this energy that just goes across look at that piece of energy there another piece comes in rotates around just busy 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 notice too off the east coast a piece of that energy cuts off and tries to swirl around. Very interesting uh, for a number of reasons. You know, is that try to? It's pretty broad. It doesn't look real concentrated. Um, and it, you know, the waters are not too warm there just yet. But it's getting to be that kind of year where you can expect the potential for subtropical development. See what happens? Everything's progressive, and then it just hits a roadblock. Bam! And everything just kind of stops and spins in place, quite literally. Uh, and there's a lot more going on globally that causes this, or at least hemispherically. But we'll have to watch this. could be interesting as more energy kind of st gets stuck out here in the uh, Four Corners region, desert southwest. Pieces of energy will eject into the uh, plains, and we'll just watch and wait and see. Hopefully, our team, a few of us, are going to leave this coming Saturday and head out to the plains for one of those troughs that comes in and see what happens with it. Do we get pieces that break off? Does it just become one large trough? We don't know. Yeah, it's a, one of those things. But we do want to get out there and do some hurricane season dress rehearsal kind of stuff with our equipment using the severe weather as a backdrop. So it's not so much, hey, the hurricane guys are going tornado chasing, as it is let's use that backdrop, like I just said, as a, an opportunity to test the equipment. One exciting thing I just wanted to mention, our weather data this year from the anemometers, these RM Young anemometers that we use, is going to be instantaneous now on the website, meaning every second, real time. And that is a real big achievement of ours, and we want to test that. So just getting it out there in some strong low-level wind flow, and we don't want a tornado to hit our equipment and bust it all up. The hurricanes do that enough. But using the severe weather as a good backdrop, again, as a dress rehearsal, and at the same time, generating some awareness for what we're doing and streaming live and testing everything. It's, it, you know, it, it's a worthy effort to get ready for hurricane season. So I believe that a week from today, we will be active. So we'll talk about that later in the coming week ahead here. All right? All right, let's get rid of that tab and move over to the tropics real quick. This is 850 millibars, or about 5,000 feet, in a different area. That's the southeast United States, right? There's uh, the greater Antilles. There's your lesser Antilles. All right, you familiar now? You know what we're looking at? It's been a while. Hadn't had to look at this in a bit. So let's scroll this out, and uh, if it'll let me. Come on. And no, you know, no bundling. This is the vorticity that we talked about. And we just take it all the way out to two weeks. There's that low that does get going. Uh, and you can see it at, at uh, 5,000 feet. Very large, spread out. It could be kind of windy and stormy and just bleh. I might, so look, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to leave Saturday next week and head out to the plains. And then off my coast, you're going to have this miserable thing 
water temperatures are still in the 60s and 70s out here. So it's going to be a chilly northeast wind, maybe some beach erosion. It could could, could get kind of nasty uh, for people that are along the uh, southeast coast there. But we'll, we'll watch that. That's still more than nine days out. But just taking this all the way out, just for fun, to the 384-hour uh, mark, you notice there's nothing. We don't see anything that bundles up in the deep tropics. There's a little area that kind of tries right here, way out at day 10. Just a little bit of energy looking like it's trying to do something down here. Nothing at all, though, that screams, we got to watch. That could be a problem. But, you know, a couple weeks from now, we might start noticing a change. Maybe some westerly winds coming in here. The Central American gyre starts to develop. We'll have to wait and see. That's the area that we really start to watch from about mid-May on, especially these last few years. All right? All right. So, HurricaneTrack.com, that's the website. Uh, it's more of a billboard now. I mean, most of our stuff is either social media, YouTube, that's where you're watching this, or we're doing this on Spotify now. Um, hopefully it worked. We'll see. And, and Facebook. We put these on Facebook as well. But um, the website is HurricaneTrack.com. Still useful to kind of get stuff out there for you, uh, including our store. And I wanted to you know, mention this. I hate selling, but if I don't sell or pitch what we're doing, I can't afford to do this, and it all goes away. So i got to be a salesman once in a while. Finally got the store a little bit better looking. I only got a couple things. We've got our new tracking map, and you know this is where it comes back to. I showed you this, and then I want to show you here. You can actually get one of those paper maps. It's only 20 bucks, and that includes shipping. You look, money's tight. I get it. Um, I only got about a hundred of these that I can sell. The rest we send to our $25 patrons uh, as part of their Patreon. You know, if they become a patron, I'll send it to you as part of it. So there's one angle. Otherwise, you can buy one. It's beautiful. It's 20 by 28. I'm sorry, 18 by 24. I keep selling it short. It's 18 by 24. And I got one right here to show you a sense of scale. Look at that. Come on. That's a nice map. I drew this thing myself in Adobe Illustrator. Stay. It's not going to stay. Um, now it's on the floor. I drew it in Adobe Illustrator back in 1999 on an old Power Mac G3. Just hang with me here. We're almost done. It's an interesting story. I did hurricane maps as my first projects. That's why my company, for tax purposes, is called Hurricane Maps Enterprises. Been that since 1996. Hurricane Track is just the brand. You understand? So... The map I created in Adobe Illustrator literally drew it point by point. And all you graphics people out there, you know what I'm talking about. It was a vector map. And I wanted the best tracking map I could do for true hurricane aficionados, people that are really into it. And I printed those uh, back in the day. They were giant, 28 uh, by 40 inches, I believe, or 30 by 40. They were huge, like a movie poster. And we got TV stations and radio stations to sell advertising and sponsor them, and they would promote them on the air. You know, go pick up your hurricane map at you know, the grocery store or the big box retailer or whatever. And um, I printed them by the hundreds of thousands each year for many, many years. And then we got into the age of apps and smartphones, and paper maps kind of died off. But what is old is now new again. Vinyl's making a comeback. So why not paper maps? So get your hands on one. You can help support what we're doing at the same time. But it's a really cool thing. And you got that Swift thing on there. You can tell everybody about it at the office when your map comes in. All right? We also have the T-shirts as well. People like our T-shirts, like what I'm wearing. Um, you got to order a bunch of them to get a good discount. So I'm making white and the uh, ice gray and the sports gray available. Those are the cheapest ones. Um, they're still $25. It's just hard to get. I mean, we, yeah, we're not going to have 2,000 people order a T-shirt. That'd be great. But if you want a T-shirt, get a T-shirt. $12 flat rate shipping to you, and we'll send it to you right from Custom Ink. And you can have a shirt very similar to what I'm wearing today. It's just in one of these colors instead of whatever this blue is I'm wearing. All right? All right. And lastly, don't forget, we are on Twitter. Facebook, our good buddy CJ handles a lot of our Facebook stuff. Thank you, CJ. I appreciate it. I do most of the YouTube and most of the Twitter, and we are on Patreon. Now, look, Patreon is how we fund this 90%. 
Ninety percent of the funding from all of, of of everything we do is from Patreon, a wonderful crowdfunding uh, machine and community that we have tied into our Hurricane Track Insider site, our our brand. So get the app. It's on the app, uh, various app stores, Google or uh, iPhone. Get Patreon. Search for Patreon, and then Hurricane Track. All one word. You can aim your smart device at the QR code if you like. And get on board. Come on. See what we got. We got our interactive map. The live cams are all there. We're on Discord. All right. We got the Discord going. A lot of good people on Discord. It is an amazing thing what the power of crowdfunding can do. And if you're in the uh, position to be a part of it, hey, you might as well do it now because it's coming. The season's going to be big enough. Um, you might as well get it in. Get in now because later on, you know, you'll be rushing uh, and wondering what was that link it's patreon.com slash hurricane track all right all right so hopefully like I said we're putting this on Spotify through anchor and I think they do video now I've seen different long-form podcasters doing that we're on YouTube and Facebook so we're growing the key here before I let you go share 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 hit that like button share this video let people know what we're doing Spread the information. Not every video is going to be long like this. You know, this is Monday. We've got a lot to cover. Um, but I'm real proud of what we've done here over the last 20 plus years. And these last 10 years especially have seen an incredible growth, especially on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's because of you guys. If it wasn't for you on the other side of your device of choice, there really wouldn't be much reason for me to be here. I'd still do it, but i got to earn a paycheck, but I also love what I do. And uh, I think that shows. And it's great to have you guys along for that journey. Uh, these last 20 plus years and today it may be a brand new today good to have you don't forget to subscribe to the channel and um, set those notifications so you know when we've posted something all right all right well speaking of notifying I better put this up so you can get notified that it's out there as always thanks for tuning in I am Mark Suddeth hurricanetrack.com I'll be back with more for you tomorrow as we talk about storm surge thanks for tuning in we'll talk again tomorrow